Commissioner Mahoney. Here. Commissioner Nash. Here. Commissioner Snyder. Commissioner Wilkins. Here. Commissioner Skolnick. Here. Okay, we have a quorum. Um, the first item is the approval of the minutes uh, of May 5th, 2020. So moved. Support. Okay, we have a motion. It's been supported. <laughs> the minutes were distributed in your packets. Are there any comments or questions? No. Nope. If not, we'll vote. I don't know. Are we doing roll call votes because uh, it's like harder to tell otherwise? Yeah, Gary or Bob, I do think we need to do roll call votes. I'm sorry, but I think that's required of us. Okay. All right, Kathy. Sorry. I hope you got a lot of roll calls. <laughs> for the minutes, too? Yeah. We better do it for everything for now. I, I think we do have to do it for everything, yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Commissioner Nash. Yes. Commissioner Skolnick. Yes. Commissioner Snyder. Is he on yet? Commissioner Wilkins. Yes. Commissioner Foster. Yes. Commissioner Hubby Wright. Yes. Chairman Hughes. Yes. Commissioner Laring. Yes. Commissioner Mahoney. Yes. That's eight. Okay, the uh, the minutes are approved. The next item is uh, public comment on an agenda item. If anyone in the public would like to comment. Um, now, how do they do that? Let's just go over that one more time. If you're on a cell phone, you push star nine, six, Star six is mute and unmute. Star nine is to raise or lower your hand to speak. Um, all right. So if you're on a cell phone, I, I see that there's 52 people. So there's a, approximately 40 public people from the public on there. If you'd like to speak, now is your opportunity. You need to un, unmute your mic or uh, press star six if you're on a cell phone to alert us that you'd like to say something. <laughs> hey, Commissioner, also up in the top right hand corner, at least there's more where that's like three dots. That's how you raise your hand in there. So you can click on that to go in there to raise your hand or start speaking, whatever you like. Okay, I don't see anybody. I don't no. either. Okay, we'll move on. Um, we've got two, two presentations today. Uh, the first one is the uh, County Parks Reopening Plan uh, by um, Community Development Director Bob Lukens. Well, thank you, Commissioners. Um, I'll go over this fairly quickly. I believe you all received a copy of it today, um, earlier today. So it is um, our outline for opening the campground on May 29th, 2020 at 8 a.m. So um, to start out, what we will do is have daily staff health screenings. So um, we will do this over Google Forms. It'll be the typical um, kind of questionnaire that is provided um, when are entering public buildings. They ask a series of three or four questions that uh, ask about the health of the individual on that particular day and if they've had any symptoms. So we will do that and encourage staff to fill that out ahead of time before they arrive to um, work. Um, if they feel they are ill during a scheduled work day, they'll be asked to stay home as everyone is these days. Um, if, if park staff members become ill at work, number two, um, the person will be, the staff member will be sent home. And if they test positive, um, Public Health Muskegon County will help us determine an isolation period for that individual worker. Um, if, if multiple employees cannot work due to the isolation, um, we 
should have enough staff to cover all of our campgrounds and other facilities. Um, staff is in the process of hiring um, additional seasonal workers at this time. So uh, right now we have nine in our employ, uh, nine seasonal workers in our employ. So we'll continue that hiring and um, we'll be ready to go on the 29th. Um, emergency sick leave coverage is available if employees do have to leave work um, due to illness um, and uh, they would be covered for a qualified isolation period. If guests become ill while they are at the uh, park, we will um, ask them to isolate themselves and or leave the campground and seek a doctor's care but we will not give them any health um, information, basically. We'll just ask them to talk to their doctor or go to an emergency room or uh, uh, other medical facility to take care of their illness or be, be diagnosed. Uh, number four, staff PPE. Uh, I've been working with Rich Warner and emergency management to acquire some additional masks. Um, Rich was able to get us some face shields too, um, and then gloves and other, um, other equipment that we'll need to be able to be safe in dealing with uh, our guests and also in cleaning our facilities. So uh, we appear to have plenty of that at this time. Uh, I know Rich said he had 500 masks for me, so that's a good thing or for us. So that's a good thing. And then we will have uh, hand sanitizer stations at various locations in the park at the check-in desk um, in some of the bathrooms or in all of the bathrooms and um, in other areas that are frequented by our guests. Number five, check-ins. Uh, check-ins now are people make their reservations online. And then when they check in, they have to sign a sheet of paper that um, indicates that they've read and will follow the rules set forth at the campground. And um, when we are dealing with these sign-ins, what we'll do is we have a, um, a plexiglass window, so to speak, up that um, the staff will sit behind and they will make um, any type of contact as with the papers, the, the rules sign-in sheet paper, um, they'll make that as, um, you know, as have that done as quickly as possible and, and minimize as much of that type of contact as possible. Um, as far as payment goes, uh, we do have a credit card swipe machine that will be placed outside so that people can swipe their cards by themselves without any assistance. Um, and we should be good to go. We'll have signage outside of the check-in building so that people can wait out there. Um, we, we will only have one person at a time checking in unless there's a backup and then we'll open up two check-in lines. Um, but still we'd like to have one person from each party uh, do the check-in. So at, at, at the max, there would be two people inside the lobby and they should be fairly adequately distanced um, if there are two people in there. We will also encourage people, of course, to uh, wear masks uh, when, they, when they do come to check in. Uh, number six, increased hand washing or sanitation stations. Um, some of those hand sanitizer stands are on back order countywide. So as those come in, we will um, place them around uh, various areas of the parks. But in the meantime, we do have spray bottles filled with sanitizer from one of our local um, companies here. We were able to procure some of that. So it's in a spray bottle uh, that can be used by guests and staff if necessary. Um, we do have fire firewood sales at the uh, lobby of Pioneer Park's check-in area and at Minard, I believe. So um, again, those will be a minimize, you know, we will minimize contact with that. If people are paying for that, we'll ask them to use a card and use the swipe machine on that. And then they will pick up their own um, bundle of firewood outside of the park or outside of the office rather. 
Um, we will have a variety of uh, obvious signage throughout the parks, uh, at the restrooms, at the check-in areas, and other areas through, throughout the parks um, to minimize um, you know, issues that may arise. And hopefully uh, you know, what people will heed the signage and um, practice distancing as recommended. Uh, campsite spacing, our campsites are uh, 40 feet wide and about 60 feet deep. So they're, they're quite large. Uh, those, are, those are the pioneer sites. And then Minerts are a bit smaller. They're 30, 30 wide by 45 deep. So what we're going to do is ask the campers to back their campers in um, to the center of the campsites so that there will be room on each side, um, again, for distancing purposes. Uh, our facilities and bathrooms, uh, we will have load limit signs on the facilities and we'll ask people to limit the number uh, that could be uh, in the bathroom or bathhouse facilities um, at, at any given time. And again, we'll ask the campers to comply with that. Um, we are hearing from people that do have reservations that they will be using their own facilities within their RVs. And um, I'll get to that in a moment, but uh, that will, you know, if people use their own facilities, that will help uh, help us keep our facilities clean and also give people peace of mind that they're using their own bathroom facilities. Um, facility cleaning and sanitation. This is the important one. Um, we will increase the frequency of restroom and bathhouse cleaning. Um, we'll make it hourly during the daylight hours if possible. On occasion, there are um, instances where staff could be late in doing that, but we will have sign-ins at, uh, at the bathrooms to indicate that staff it has performed cleaning and sanitation duties. Um, as we clean the bathrooms, they are closed, so we will direct people to other bathroom facilities that are still open um, that they may use. Shower hours, um, the showers are open all the time now, but we're going to encourage people to use showers during off peak times um, when, when the facilities may not be as crowded or there may not be as much demand. Uh, as far as cleaning procedures go, the staff will have masks, gloves, face shields, um, and uh, wear long sleeve shirts. And we would like to have um, a disinfecting pump sprayer that we'll use to spray down the facility with disinfectant. And we do have uh, a, a fogger on order. Uh, this is an electrostatic fogger that, that works better than a sprayer. So as you can imagine, those are um, on back order, but as soon as we get one of those, we'll put that into good use at the parks. Um, RV camper uh, self-isolation, that really means uh, we're asking campers to use their own restroom facilities within their camper. And um, as I said, many of the guests we've talked to that have reservations are planning on doing that anyway. So I think a lot of people will be doing that as they come out to camp at our facilities. Um, we're also encouraging RV campers to bring their um, buddy tanks along. Uh, these allow for additional capacity for gray and black water. So um, people have indicated that they would be doing that to, to extend the dump time uh, for their uh, RV. Uh, we do have dump facilities at Pioneer, Minard, and Blue Lake, the three county campgrounds. Um, those are all in order and working well. Um, checkouts are automatic, so uh, people check out. Um, that, that's indicated within the reservation system and people are aware of when the checkout times are. If they linger a little longer, what we typically do is, is uh, go out and ask them uh, to remove their camper because typically other people will be camping in the sites. Um, we've also extended the season to October 4th for our long-term and seasonal campers. We don't have many of them, but um, sometimes they will stay, will stay um, till, the, till the end. So we've extended that a few extra days. Um, I think it's 10 extra, or no, it's about a week extra. And um, 
people will be allowed to stay during that time period. Um, a lot of that is weather dependent, though. Um, that's it for the plan. One thing I did want to mention to you today, commissioners, is this morning I got a call from park staff and our group camp camping area uh, at Pioneer Park has washed out completely. What was once our group camping area is now a river that has cut through a dune to Lake Michigan. So um, we're, we're monitoring that area. Um, there was some exposed electrical work, uh, exposed plumbing there. Um, the electricity was shut off. We've also contacted consumers to, to pull the fuse on, on the, uh, on the uh, transformer that's right there. And it has taken out probably two or three acres worth of sand and dune from that uh, group campsite, which is right next to Lake Michigan. So we now have a large um, kind of river valley there um, that, that spreads out into a delta into Lake Michigan. It's, it's quite a sight to see, honestly. And I, I will send you that photos from that today. Um, it's, we will be um, adding that to the list of um, emergency management um, flood issues that they're keeping track of so that we may potentially see some um, insurance, uh, an insurance claim from that because it's a big chunk of land that we lost out there. Commissioner Skolnick, could I ask a question? Yes, uh, Susie, go ahead. Uh, I would like to know um, about your community fires and, and your community area down there and the individual fires. What about people sitting so close around the fire pits? The community uh, areas, do you mean the group area? Yes. That's the area that got washed out. Okay. And what it's about- no um, longer there. What about playgrounds? The playgrounds will remain closed, Commissioner, until we get um, notification from the state that they can be reopened. We'll have signage and some um, caution tape around them. Um, I've, in my travels throughout the county, I've seen um, most, if not all, playgrounds continue to be closed um, for for local park district or local parks, and um, you know, in the city here in Muskegon um, and elsewhere throughout the county, playgrounds are closed. So we'll, we will keep ours closed until they're deemed safe to open. Thank you very much. Commissioner Skolnick, I see that Commissioner Laring has his hand raised. Okay, yes. Commissioner yeah. Laring. Thank you. Uh, Bob, I thought you were going to present an alternative plan to open up the park for Memorial Day. Uh, th this is our plan, and, you know, there – the executive order has not been rescinded. So at this time, we're looking at the 29th as the opening date, Commissioner. Commissioner Skolnick? Yes, real estate, I, okay, I'm sorry. I, raise your, may you know, may I ask a question? Yes, yes, can you hear me? Go ahead. Yes, uh-huh. Uh, I would like to ask Bob, if we will be doing any screenings, temperature screenings for the people that are registered and coming into the camp. At this time, we won't, Commissioner, unless instructed to do so. Okay. If, uh, Bob, I'd like to ask a question. That, that area that was washed out, um, I'm having a hard time visualizing that. Is that something, is that, that's just, that's just mother nature. There's no fixing that, is there? No, it's, um, it, as I mentioned, a huge area was washed out. This group campground area can hold a couple hundred people in, in tents, I believe. I think it's a few hundred. It's a big area that has been washed out. And I would say maybe three or four, well, maybe two to three acres have been just washed out into the lake. It, um, the, the, the area was covered in four feet of water before the washout. Um, so staff was monitoring it yesterday, um, but they did not feel comfortable walking into the water to turn off the electricity. So um, 
at about nine o'clock last night, we got a call that one of the, uh, or, or that it had washed out. And um, in the morning when we surveyed it, it was just devastated. It's catastrophic. Bob, you have pictures for that too to share. Bob, I do, yes. Yeah. And I can set, send them right now to the commissioners. Okay. Hey, Bob, just one more question. The area that was washed out, was it like a, a huge amount of sand that got washed into Lake Michigan? Yes. Okay. It, it took out a portion of a dune that was probably, oh, 50 feet high, maybe 60 feet high. It was where the stairs were that go down to the beach. So the stairs are 100 yards out in Lake Michigan now. Yeah, that's a lot of sand. Okay, Bob, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, all right, we're going to move on to um, the additional presentation item B, uh, the Muskegon County COVID-19 Preparedness and Response Plan. Um, and the county administrator is going to give us this report. Good afternoon, everybody. This report is based off of the package that you were sent, this one right here. I'm not gonna put this one up there because you have uh, roughly 27 pages there, but I will have it, actually it's 40 pages. I have the uh, PowerPoint for you and that's what we'll go over right now. But this PowerPoint is in reference to the preparedness and the response plan. Um, it's all in compliance with the state of Michigan's order of 2020-77, dated May 7, 2020. So every county is putting a plan similar to this together. Next slide, please. The, um, in cooperation with uh, um, the Municipal Risk Management, MMRMA, is it had a plan similar to this that she, they shared with all cities and counties. And then also the courts um, had a big part of this uh, plan as well as they shared their plan with us last week. Next. On section one of the report, it really talks about pre-opening, which we're calling it phase one, which is matches up with the courts, what the courts is phase one is. And currently we're in this phase. Uh, we're closed to the public. Uh, no visitors unless it's scheduled, uh, especially in the courts, um, which is considered essential. Um, basic operation, what that means is, for example, wastewater is operating, uh, public health is operating, Health West is operating mats, the airport. So there's some basic operations that are, are still serving the people. But then there's other, all the other departments are working in way, one way or another, serving uh, those who call in or emails that they receive. Next. This phase two reopening, um, section two of the document. We really uh, sat down with the commissioners last, I mean, not the commissioners, but the directors last week and talked about uh, the safest way to come back into the public, uh, serving the public, but also the safest way for our employees, for us to be able to serve our employees and that they feel comfortable coming back to work as well. In discussing uh, soft opening, what we like to see is employees only start uh, June 1st, uh, return to work. Um, they need to figure out uh, the best way to stagger their start times to reduce the number of people in the elevators and hallways. Um, when you come into the front building, you'll have a, uh, for the administration building, for the courthouse building included, the clerks, the sheriff, the prosecutor, all is under one, you'll be asked for your temperature, you'll be asked for five questions. So that's gonna take place. And you also have to go through screening. So that we know that's gonna back up. So this first week of June 1st to the 5th, we really wanna work with our employees to figure out what is safe uh, for them, the best way we can uh, handle crowds coming through. And again, that includes uh, possibly uh, changing start times and start finishes anywhere from 7.30, 8, 8.30 to 9. Um, we'll continue to encourage uh, employees to work um, remotely, uh, telework, we're calling that. Um, we'll discuss more about the work share program later, but also we have um, 117 furloughs currently in the process. So uh, many departments have um, furloughed with your leadership on that to uh, allow that to occur. 
and that is still occurring to date. Um, the, the next bullet point there talks about the continued downward trajectory of positive tests over additional 14 days. And Kathy's working with us on that now, and she's sharing those graphs with us. Um, again, last night she said another graph. And the cumulative rate shows it's dropping, but the moving average shows it's continuing a little bit. So we really want to make sure that the moving average really starts showing a downward trend in 14 days to bring back the public. Face next um, slide, yeah. So limiting opening date, which is a phase three. And th this here is where we got our health screening building entrance. Uh, we're still requiring people to wear a face mask. Uh, temperature checks required and physical distance. All that still occurs as we did in phase two. But the important one about this is, is that 14 day limit. That 14 day limit uh, could equate to 28 days time you get to phase three. So if we were to start the last week of May, when it's open up to the public, everybody's coming in, it's June 22nd. If our moving average uh, doesn't drop until the first week of June, we're looking at June 29th before the building is really open to the public. Again, the purpose of this is to make it safe for our employees and then make it safe for the uh, residents uh, from the scene County coming into the building. Um, those are the first uh, three sections of our, of our uh, document here. The next section I wanna go into is the uh, courts. So I'm gonna jump to section six and then come back and finish off with section four and five. Section six, which is the Michigan County uh, plan to return to full capacity. I have Patrick on standby to talk a little bit about these next two pages. Go ahead, Patrick. Thank you, uh, commissioners. Um, yeah, we, we've been in close communication with uh, my, my colleagues, the uh, court administrators and the, uh, the chief uh, judges of the courts, as well as the uh, state court administrative office. Uh, and wanted, of course, to share that information with you in the work session about what the Supreme Court's order is regarding um, um, you know, return to full capacity within the courts. Um, one of the things that I'm very pleased with about the administration's position is that to, to the extent that um, uh, it's possible, we've, we've tried to work in tandem to mirror up um, the uh, the county uh, phase reopening plan with um, uh, the order of the Supreme Court, knowing full well that uh, a lot of the traffic that's generated within this building, particularly, is driven by by court operations. So I'm um, uh, very happy to, to answer any questions that, uh, that you might have um, specific to uh, the court's reopening plan, but it has been incorporated and embedded into um, the overall county's um, uh, phase reopening structure as well as part of the COVID response plan. And that really covers the next two slides. Again, phase one, phase two, the next slide, please, where it goes into phase three and phase four. Uh, Patrick, talk a little bit on phase three and four, what you see on that as well. Yeah, what's what's interesting about where we are, I think, as, as, um, as, Muskegon, as Muskegon County Courts, we're kind of already doing the things that the, the Supreme Court has ordered in phases one and two even though technically we're not there yet because we haven't met those gating criteria. Um, the things that uh, the Supreme Court has said trial courts across the state should be doing in phases one and phase two, we're already performing now. So we're looking ahead to what does it mean when we're able to move through those phases based on the data in our community, based on the, the, the things that we've been able to do, um, the things that we can control in terms of the building and the social distancing and the measures that we put in place in terms of our internal policies, we're looking to phases three and four for a real actual shift in terms of what court operations are going to look like. Um, really, the biggest change is that that's when our vulnerable employees are going to be able to, to, to be uh, here in the courthouse uh, working um, uh, directly face to face with the public. When the public uh, facing activities really resume, um, when the physical distancing um, protocols are extended to the general public, not just to our staff. Um, but making sure that we're enforcing those among the general public that are here within the courthouse. That's part of phase three. And, um, and that we're doing everything we can to make sure that we're minimizing any crowded spaces. Um, I, I'm sure many of you commissioners have been here on, you know, Monday um, uh, mornings where, you know, there are multiple crowded areas within the courthouse 
uh, just by virtue of what's scheduled. Um, we have to adapt and change our scheduling to make sure that we're doing things that spread people out and space them out within this building when they're returning in phase three. Um, phase three is really where we start to see things shift more toward anything close to what we would call normal, but it's going to be a new kind of normal for the court for sure. And then finally, that phase four is really, um, uh, once again, the, the, those criteria have been met for a sustained uh, period. And uh, I don't know just when this is going to happen, but that language, again, the reason we put it in quotes is because that's what's in the order, um, that the court's ready to move to phase four, the final phase, basically resuming uh, unrestricted court operations when there's been a public health announcement that this, uh, this pandemic has fully been suppressed. Um, and uh, I don't know just when that's going to be, um, but uh, that would be when, when we've moved through all of the progressive phases and the Supreme Court has, has signed off on uh, the assets that we make to them that we've, um, we've completed each of those phases specific to our community. Thank you, Patrick. On, on that preparedness and the response plan, putting this together and, and bringing the court's uh, requirements into what the rest of the other 18 departments are looking at, it's difficult because you got some departments already working and you got some um, who are 100% remote working from home. So Bill, to bring these two together, um, it seemed back to the basics. What are we trying to do? Are we trying to protect the public? Are we trying to protect our, our employees? And I, I think both are critical and our employees are very critical. And that's why in saying that, we don't really know when phase two to phase three will begin. It really all depends on our moving average and how that looks as it comes down over the next couple of weeks. So it's going to be a slow ramp up. We're, we're not going to be able to open our doors up the next day and say, hey, it's gone. We're opening up. It's going to be a slow ramp up to make that progress through. Um, moving on um, to the next slide there. Uh, protective safety and measures. The next three are for Kristen Wade. She's going to chime in here and talk a little bit about uh, COVID-19 and how it relates to our safety protocol. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So section four of the plan addresses employee benefits. Section so three, let's start with wanted... section three. Oh, section, section three, three, protective, yeah, protective safety measures. Okay. So um, let me... Pull that up here real quick. So from um, the safety measure standpoint, speaking about employees, um, certainly we want to make sure that employees are keeping themselves safe as well as their coworkers um, and any public that they may come in contact with. So it's going to be very important that they stay home when they're ill. Um, there will be screening before entering the workplace. So Kathy Moore has been able to give us guidelines on how that can look. There's a couple of different options, whether they're screened at the workplace or they do self-monitoring. Um, it sounds like there could be an app available as well as some logging sheets so that we can have employees that are um, asking themselves essentially questions before they go to work and taking their temperature to make sure that they are safe to go to work. And then at the workplace, there will be um, the enhanced social distancing, making sure that we're all respecting that six foot distance between employees. Everyone will be wearing masks um, while you're at your workstation. Uh, employees will be able to take their masks off, but when they leave their individual workspace, if they're in common areas, break rooms, restrooms, anything like that, um, employees will be required to wear face masks. Facilities has been working, obviously, on lots of enhanced cleaning, as well as having hand sanitizer in the offices. We'll be having employees that will be wiping down their own work areas and making sure to keep um, areas clean and sanitized. And then from a travel standpoint, business travel, um, we're hearing that most all conferences and seminars and all of those types of things are canceled anyways, but making sure that we limit um, any travel and business travel so that employees are um, staying safe County vehicles, 
if it's an option, they'll be using personal vehicles instead of county vehicles and limiting the number of employees, um, only one employee in a vehicle at a time. Section four, employee benefits. All right. So section four, talking about employee benefits, the emergency paid sick leave and the extended family medical leave that fell under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, those have both been in place since April 1st. So we've been working with employees. Um, we currently have 27 employees right now that are on one of those two uh, approved leaves. So we'll be continuing to do those and uh, work with employees from that standpoint. And um, the employee assistance programs, we certainly want to make sure that employees are taking advantage of those and are aware of the many resources that are available through our employee assistance programs. Um, everything from substance abuse and mental health and those types of things that are really important right now during all of this. In addition, health insurance, there's been additional um, through Blue Cross Blue Shield, they have offered additional uh, telehealth and the um, COVID testing and treatment with no employee cost share. So making sure that we have employees that are aware of those types of services and taking advantage of all of that, um, waiving prior authorization, all of those types of things. Thank you. And in the last slide here, uh, we'll just wrap this up real quick. This is our last few slides here. Um, for those employees who kind of feel ill but has not been positive, we're looking at seven days since the system started, um, and then they come back with a negative test. If you have a positive test, we're looking at seven days off um, the first start and 72 hours after the fever is resolved. Um, so there, there's different scenarios from both. Uh, we definitely want our employees to stay home if they are feeling sick. And as Kathy Morris said, and many a times to encourage them to call a doctor if, if they feel like they need to. The last page uh, wrapping up here, this is the very last um, of our whole appendices here, the uh, A through F, um, A through G actually, um, references where we received all this information from. So there's a quite a bit there. I mean, it is a 40 page report there that uh, we're gonna be adopting on Thursday with the comments uh, added today. Uh, we'll add those as well, or any questions we'll get clarifications on. But the idea is to have this in place before employees uh, start back to work. Any questions? Yeah, Martha? Yes. Yeah, um, there is no uh, special reference to the, the jail or, well, to the jail. Um, are we testing every employee and resident in the jail or inmate? Yeah, the, the sheriff might chime in here, but the sheriff has his own protocol for the jail. Okay. It's a congregant facility. <laughs> yeah, Sheriff, are you on? By, or uh, under I Sheriff? saw him on. I, I'm here. She muted herself, so I'm not aware if there was a question. <clears throat> you repeat the question, Commissioner? Yes, the question is, um, are, are we testing all the employees and the inmates in the jail? No, we are not. Shouldn't we be? We did test one team uh, when a staff member had tested positive. Uh, there currently is a program going on. Um, I received a call uh, yesterday from the um, from Emergency Management Department of Michigan State Police, and they're, off they're offering tests to all the jails. Um, I'm just uh, trying to uh, really understand the idea of allowing people that we don't know inside a facility when we have a system that's working and uh, no positive cases or anybody that's even symptomatic um, and opening up them to some type of exposure. But uh, these tests are also only voluntary. We can't force anybody to do it inside the jail. Does that make sense? And, Is it, and, isn't there something happening on Thursday 
and maybe it's just nursing homes, but where the National Guard is coming in to test all the residents and uh, uh, employees at nursing homes. And I thought they were going to do jails too, but I could be wrong. They are offering to do jails. Yes, it would be. I'm, my assumption is it would be the same group. Um, I was reading an article today out of the uh, Kalamazoo County um, where they had like 80 volunteers, I believe it was, to do it. Um, I guess I would understand this if we were going to test 100% of the inmates, if we had that capability um, through volunteering, uh, agreeing with it. But if we're not going to test 100%, then I don't see the reason to do it. I'd rather stick with the plan and the protocol that we set in place since uh, <coughs> mid-March and uh, stick with that plan. Any other questions, commissioners? Mark, I had a question on the um, on the um, the paid leave act. Do we have anyone on that paid leave act right now? Uh, yes, we have. Yes, we have twenty seven employees currently on the paid leave. Okay, and is there a limit, a time limit on that? As far as how long they can be on it? Correct. <laughs> it depends on which portion they're on. So if they're on the extended FMLA for childcare, for instance, um, you know, when they have that ability to have the childcare again, then it ends. Um, if they're under a quarantine situation, then when their doctor releases them from quarantine, for example, um, they would be released. But the act in itself goes through the end of the year, December 31st. However, okay. you know, it just depends on individual situations when they would continue to qualify. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that it? Thank Bob, you. Bob, I have one question. Yes, um, Mark. Mark, when did you mail this out, this plan to the commissioners? I have not seen it yet. Friday. Okay, thank you. And what we can we can send it again today. Well, I, I can I didn't see it Friday, so thank you. All right. Uh presentations are done. We'll move on to um items for consideration. Uh the first one is WM 20-05-40 to approve payment of the accounts payable of $3,627,821.25 uh, covering the period of April 25th, 2020 through May 7th, 2020 for checks as presented by the county clerk. So move. I need support. Support. All right, we've got a motion that's been supported. The um, major items have been uh, listed in the, for information in, in the uh, motion detail. Um, I have a question here, uh, Bob, if I could. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Susan. I was wondering, I see that there's a payment to Lakeshore Regional Energy for $211,000, $211,254. Um, for the liquor tax payment, is there any reason we couldn't keep that and just apply that towards what the LRE already owes us? Uh, this is Beth Dick, Director of Finance. Uh, that is separate and apart from everything else that we're owed. Um, this is money that comes into the general fund, not to Health West. So okay. this money, we get uh, liquor tax payments throughout the year, and then half of that has to go back to the regional entity. And then they um, basically grant that out to um, grant money, liquor tax money out to various organizations that apply for it, which our public health department does apply for um, a significant amount through them. Okay, I was just wondering, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Bob, I have a question if I may. Yes, go ahead, Zach. So I, I'm not, this isn't a motion, but so I, there's been some discussion on the board that we don't like approving these payments after they've already been made. And I am wondering just maybe a consensus of the board, uh, debate among the board, if there's any consensus for a line item veto on some of these. Right now we have to approve the entire payments in a whole 
Uh, I don't like paying them after they or approving them after they've been paid. But is there any consensus in the board that maybe we should do these independently? That we could line item veto them and vote on them individually. That's just for debate. That wasn't a motion. If anyone wants to chime in and chat about that, I'd love to have that conversation. I would like to add one thing. These are the top 10 things that Beth picked out. There's obviously a lot more than this that adds up yeah. to 3.6 million. So currently we're only showing things roughly over a hundred thousand. Correct Beth? That is correct. Okay. Um, Wait, uh, I have I have a question, Bob. Okay, Marsha, go ahead. Actually, I know the sheriff can explain it, but under number nine, payment to WatchGuard Inc. for $202,000 for sheriff's car with no S and body camera equipment. I'm sure that's not the right description. Could you uh, clarify, Sheriff Poulin? Um, what's the, the clarification? The misspelling? Well, I didn't no. Well, I can it looks like it's only car and body equipment for two hundred and two thousand. It seems like a lot for one. It's vehicle cameras and body cameras. So, if you prefer the word vehicle and body camera equipment, there were twenty eight okay. um, body cameras and, or excuse me, there were fifty six body cameras and twenty eight vehicle cameras. That, that makes more purchased. sense. Thank you. Okay. And it's all with grant funds. Commissioner yeah. Hovey, right. Um, as I stated, I didn't write that, um, but I'll be more yeah. happy to answer questions. Thank you. No, no, Beth explained it. It sounds fine. There was, should be an S there somewhere. <laughs> All right. Any, anybody else? I have one more question, Bob. All right, go ahead. The, um, the PA2, is that half of the PA2? It's half of the payment that we received, um, the most recent payment we received. I believe we get those quarterly. So we would have received double that amount. We keep half and we send half back. Oh, we get that quarterly. I okay. believe it's quarterly. I'd have to double check, but I'm thinking it is quarterly. I thought it was annually because if that's half, it seems like it's about 20000 less than last year. And I was wondering why it was going down instead of up. Yeah, it actually might only be semi-annually. I have to double check because I know that we just received our um, estimate for next year and it's the total is somewhere around 800, a little over 800,000. So it actually okay. might only be semi-annually. Okay. Okay, um, I need a roll call. Kathy, could you do a uh, roll call on, on this motion? Commissioner Foster. Yes. Commissioner Hubby Wright. Yes. Chairman Hughes. Yes. Commissioner Laring. No. Commissioner Mahoney. Yes. Commissioner Nash. Yes. Commissioner Snyder. I know he's on. He is on. John, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Wilkins. Commissioner Skolnick. Yes. E yes, one no. Okay. Um, moving on to WM 20 slash 05 41 to approve the attached truth and taxation public hearing schedule and to adopt the attached resolution setting June 9th, 2020 as the date for the Truth in Taxation public hearing for the purpose of discussing and receiving testimony regarding the proposed tentative levy of 5.6978 mills for Muskegon County General Operating in July 2020. The proposed tentative levy of 0 0.3220 mills for Lake, the Lakeshore Museum Center operating in December, 2020. The, um, the proposed levy of 0 0.0751 mills for the Department of Veteran Affairs operating in December, 2020. The proposed tentative levy of 0 0.2999 mills for Muskegon County Central Dispatch operating in December, 2020. 
in the proposed tentative levy of 0.4999 mills for PA 39 of 1976 uh, activities of services for Older Persons Act in December of 2020. So moved. Support. Okay, we've got a motion that's been supported. Essentially, uh, Beth, you want to say anything? The actual millage rate uh, went down a little bit. Am I correct? That is correct. Um, uh, last year, the actual county's operating levy was 5.6984 mills. This year, it is being rolled back due to the Headley Amendment that was um, added to the Constitution back in 1978, which um, basically does not allow the annual growth of, of our um, taxes to exceed the rate of inflation. So there's a calculation that has to be done annually to calculate uh, what that factor is. And if it ends up being below one, then you actually have to do what's called a headly rollback. And that actually happened this year. We have not had a headly roll rollback impact our millage rate since 2002. It has been at 5.6984 mills from 2002 through 2019. And this year it's being rolled back just slightly to 5.6978 mills along with the other um, countywide millages on the list here. Th those all got rolled back slightly as well due to Headley. Um, the, some of the supporting documentation behind the motion shows how the calculation um, is done and also a public notice that has to be put in the, the newspaper um, advertising the public hearing, which has the heading increase in property taxes, which is very misleading, but we're required to use that language um, because if we do not hold the public hearing, then we actually won't even be able to, we won't be able to levy those millage rates that are listed there. It would be something less than that. So that's why the wording increase is used because if we don't hold the public hearing, um, we would be restricted to a lower level of millages. Um, so in order to get to basically, and I have been used to saying back to the same rates we were last year, but unfortunately this year, it's not even as, as high as the same rates as last year. Um, due to the Headley rollback effect. So we actually have a slight uh, millage reduction. So, reduction in the rate, correct. Correct. Are there any uh, any questions, comments on this before we vote? Um, okay, we'll vote. Kathy, more, another roll call, please. If your microphone is muted, um, Please turn it on so you can vote. Commissioner Harvey Wright. Yes. Chairman Hughes. Yes. Commissioner Laring. Yes. Commissioner Mahoney. Yes. Commissioner Nash. Yes. Commissioner Snyder. Yes. Commissioner Wilkins. Commissioner Foster. Yes. Commissioner Skolnick. Yes. Nine yes. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Uh, the next item is WM20-05-42 to award the space needs and facility condition assessment to DLZ Michigan Incorporated not to exceed $115,200 and authorize the chair to sign the agreement and amend the budget accordingly. So moved. Support. Okay, we have a motion that's been supported. Any comments or questions? Yes, I have a question on that. Yes, Susie. The bid is 96,000 and staff is further requesting a 20% contingency fund. I would rather see that come back if they have an extra rather than just automatically authorize 20%. And it, look, it looks like you actually added the 20% onto the 96,000. Mark, you want to comment? Mark, your, your microphone is muted. I think they're Matt? probably coming. Matt. Yeah, yeah. Matt, Matt, are you on? Yeah. Yes. 
that we're here. Um, yes, yeah, that, that is what we did is added a contingency in case something different comes up that needs to be looked at. Uh, but if the commissioners prefer to stick to the 96 and bring everything else back, we're totally fine with that as well. I, I would much prefer that. And I would like to make a friendly amendment that we authorize the 96,000. And if there are additional uh, costs that they come back before us. Susie, did you make the motion? No, I did not. Okay. She made the friendly amendment. Okay. So we, you're, you're, you want to make an amendment to roll it back to the original bid. Yes, the 96,000. Is there support for that? Support. Okay, we have support. Um, so the we're going to vote on the, unless there's other discussion, we're going to vote on the friendly amendment to put that bid back to the original bid. If, if it goes over for some reason, it'll come back to us. Um, are there any comments? Uh, Commissioner Laring? No, no comment. Okay. All right, uh, another roll call, Kathy. Chairman Hughes. Yes. yes. Commissioner Laring. Yes. Commissioner Mahoney. Yes. Commissioner Nash. Yes. Commissioner Snyder. Yes. Commissioner Wilkins. Commissioner Foster. Yes. Commissioner Hovey Wright. Yes. Commissioner Skolnick. Yes. Nine yes. Okay. And what um, what was the amount of does any what was the original bid? Matt, do you have the, the exact amount? Ninety six thousand. Was it ninety six thousand even? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, so I have an, a comment on the original motion. Yes, go ahead. So if I understand this correctly, this is the motion for facility use for uh, additional courtroom space that we don't know that we need yet because there's not any evidence that there's going to be another judge coming to Muskegon County at this time. And I am concerned that this is a back door towards the Hackley administration, um, that the county's trying to purchase the Hackley administration building through this proposal. This is Mark, I can address uh, the Hackley part of that. No, this is not a back door to that. We'll be discussing uh, future space, whether it's a Hackley or any other building with the commissioners. Uh, we would not move forward without the support of the commissioners. Um, Besides the courts needing additional uh, courtroom, even if we didn't do that, even if that was not a part of the discussion, Commissioner, uh, prior to that, if you recall, we did a study on redoing sixth floor, and Chief Judge Hicks will probably come on that. I've just seen his hand go up. But yeah, we were wanting to redo the sixth floor, and to redo the sixth floor, we would have to move administration and the commissioners out of this building. We still need to find another facility. I remember we were talking about that with you because you mentioned the, um, uh, the the bus location, um, mm -hmm. McMurray Building at one time. Uh, Commissioner, yeah, I, me, go ahead, Commissioner. Uh, well, that that's my point. The the purpose of this motion, it, we came up in a work session uh, that we would do a study, a space needs study. Um, but we're not on the sixth floor we're on the fourth floor and i don't know why we would need if this study is only re to represent the needs of the sixth floor i don't know why we would need to incorporate moving the commissioners out of the boardroom and and i'm not opposed to moving out if it can be done cheaply and, and i don't care if we meet in a garage but uh or on zoom but what i'm concerned is is that this is all coming, it came to the work session about the potential, I think it was in 2023, that we might have an additional judge added to our community and we would need to prepare space. Well, I don't see spending $100,000 for something that woulda, coulda, shoulda possibly happened. We, we would have to wait for the legislature to make that decision that we'd receive this extra judge. Um. Yeah, I can't see. Oh, Susie, did you have a comment or is that just your I had a comment? No, I, I, I had a comment. Go ahead. 
Okay. I was just saying that I'm, I, I just want to everyone understand. I, I don't support the motion at all. One, because it's not budgeted. And two, because we have some financial situations that we're going to have to deal with in this year and the next year coming up. And right now, I, I think it's one time that we need to take a close look at our finances, considering uh, the different places that we are in different departments with finances. And we don't know what we're going to need. And I just don't want to see us wipe ourselves out. Charles, and, and I, I have to agree with Charles. And I do have some concerns that right now we've gone through this COVID-19 exercise and found out that we do have some people that are very willing and very capable of working and performing the workload at home. And I think that needs to be considered in the situation too. And so I, I agree with Charles. I would not be for this motion, especially at 115. That's why I made the motion to make it back to 96,000. But if there was a motion to not approve this motion, I would vote for that. All right, anybody else? I think one of the things that um, they were gonna assess was the condition of all the county buildings and uh, the equipment, uh, heating, heating, you know, roofs, everything else. I think, um, you know, if we want to post, if we want to do this later, that's, I guess that's fine. But I think it's a smart move to look at what may be, what will be coming up eventually before we're hit with uh, uh, an unexpected, uh, a large unexpected expenditure on a building that could have been foreseen. But- uh, Mister. Uh, there's two people that had their hands up. One is Judge Hicks. Yes. You know, I'm going to let, I'm going to recognize Judge Hicks. The, this is the first time in 10 years I've got Bob Schoolnet to recognize me and give me a chance to say anything. I didn't, I, Kim, I didn't recognize you with the short hair. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have any, any substantial disagreement with what you all are saying. I just wanted to highlight two things. The, uh, the sixth floor at some point needs to be done. I don't think I'm going to see it done during my tenure, which has about two years to go. But just, and you've been supportive of that. I appreciate it. If you have any doubt about the sixth floor in terms of ADA, bathroom compliance, security issues, just stop up sometime and I can help you with that. The space is probably acceptable, I think, generally, but sixth floor has to be done. The other point I want to make back to Commissioner uh, Larry, he started out by saying there's no evidence. And there's that's sort of right, but I just wanted you all to remember that the official uh, Supreme Court recommendation in the Judicial Resources Report is for us to get uh, another judge. Now, that process has input from you that's required and input from the state. So I think you guys are right about that. But there is some evidence, you know, they've studied it, that we do need another judge. Now, uh, how we go ahead with that, I think, is entrusted to your work and our work. And I appreciate your consideration of all those things. All right. Um, anybody else? Um, Just, yes, Ken, did you? Well, and back to your point, Bob, this study is more than just looking at the sixth floor. Uh, it's looking at all of our facilities. And some of those, for example, across the street on the old South Campus, probably a bulldozer would be better than uh, what we're doing at this point. So a, a good look at those buildings, see what we can salvage, what needs to be taken out. Uh, it's not just about the sixth floor. It's about looking at all of our facilities. Well, um, whether we do this today or in the future, I, I, uh, I tend to agree with, uh, some, just because we don't know what the impact of the virus is gonna be on our budget, and this could be postponed a little bit, but I honestly don't, I don't think we should just wait until fate takes charge of uh, our buildings, um, but this is probably not the best time to be spending unbudgeted money. So, um, We'll vote on this. Uh, Kathy, roll call, please. Commissioner, uh, Director Farah had his hand up. I didn't know if he wanted to speak. I'm sorry, Matt, I didn't see it. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I think it was pointed out. I'm at Farah Public Works. 
But the, the majority of this cost is for facility condition assessment that staff has wanted, you know, before this the sixth floor up, before a new judge was a potential, before Hackley, before anything. Um, you know, we submit our capital improvement plan every year. Definitely some needs here, um, a lot of needs. Uh, the last facility condition assessment done on the Hall of Justice in old jail was over two decades ago, and there's never been one done here at the former Baker College campus. Um, felt it was, you know, time to, to do that. And with the proceeds from uh, Brookhaven going to the Building Improvement Fund, uh, that would be an appropriate use of that, um, you know, to evaluate what needs to be done next. So for instance, in Building A, we have two boilers. Um, one is down for the count, uh, the other is on life support. We are going to fix that whether it be on an emergency basis or on a plan basis. And, and it's not just that. I can give you examples like this in every building uh, of things that are coming up. So we felt it best uh, if we had a facility condition assessment, um, we could better anticipate a better, you know, put what resources we do have towards our most pressing and beneficial uh, need. Um, as far as the uh, space need evaluation, you know, keep in mind, we put county government into a college campus, if you will, that wasn't designed to serve county um, government. So the space needs assessment, which I believe is less than twenty thousand of this, um, uh, would you know help us? Are we are we are, are we using our space appropriately to its maximum efficiency? So uh, so again, it was more than just um, a new judge or a sixth floor. It's, it involves other things as well. Thank you. I'd like to know what it is we're voting on before we vote, please. We're voting on spending $96,000 on the space needs and the facility uh, condition assessment. Thank you. So, um, okay, so we will vote now, Kathy, if you've got any more forms left. Commissioner Foster. No. Commissioner Hubby Wright. Marcia, your microphone is off. Yes. Chairman Hughes. No. Commissioner Laring. No. Commissioner Mahoney. Yes. Commissioner Nash. No. Commissioner Snyder. Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Commissioner Wilkins. I didn't hear you, Commissioner Wilkins. You're muted. I hear you through the other room. I heard her say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Commissioner Skolnick. Uh, no for now. It's no. five no. <laughs> five no, four yes. Can I just make a recommendation that why don't we just make sure we put this in the budget for next year? Okay. Excellent right. idea. Um, moving on, uh, the next item is WM20-05-43 to approve renewal of the annual maintenance and support agreement for the Pure Storage Network storage array for $26,016 to be procured from CDW as a sole source. I need so moved. A motion support. And we got a motion and support. Um, I should mention, um, this is a maintenance agreement. It's another year of the maintenance agreement. We've been doing this for several years. I don't, do we have some around motion? Yeah. Mark, is there an IT person here? Yes, Ivan Phillips is on. Ivan, do you want to talk about this for a second? There we go. You have to unmute yourself, Ivan. The little mic there. <laughs> He's an IT guy. I'm, I'm laughing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can figure it out. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a mute. What was the question? You want to just just the the twenty six thousand uh, dollars for the maintenance and support for the pure storage network. You just want to give us just a real quick what that is. Sure. This uh, pure storage array is the non spinning disk side of our storage. This equipment we purchased about approximately three years ago, and this is simply nothing but maintenance and support for that equipment that allows us to do what's called an evergreen. So that when it comes time to upgrade that equipment, we don't have to rebuy the equipment. We can trade that one in and get a new one. We kind of already purchased it, if you will. Okay. Are there any other questions? Any questions at all? If not, Bob, I don't think we're showing the right motion. I don't think so either. We're on number forty-three. We're on item 43. We're approving the renewal of the, ma the maintenance it's, and support agreement for the network. I don't think 43 is what's on the screen. Oh. The, it is now. They just switched it. Okay. I'm, work I'm working off the, the printed copy of the agenda. I'm not even looking at what's on the screen. Okay. Yeah, I got the printed copy too. I just noticed that some people probably aren't. All right. Kathy, you want to please do there it? There it is. Mr. Laring. Yes. Commissioner Mahoney. Yes. Commissioner Nash. Yes. Commissioner Snyder. Yes. Commissioner Wilkins. I could hear her. Commissioner Foster. Yes. Commissioner Hubby Wright. Yes. Chairman Hughes. Yes. And Commissioner Skolnick? Yes. Nine, yeah. Okay, that motion passes. And then the final item is WM 20 slash 05 44 to authorize the deletion of database administrator X 25101, uh, salary range adjustment for the vacant on base uh, administrator position X 72601 from NX 00320. $30.361 an hour to $38.398 an hour to NX-00290, $26.406 per hour to $33.324 per hour. Reclassify information systems um, tax 1 N4004 and N4005 and ECM coordinator tier one N29501 at pay table grade N0 0200 17.426 an hour to 22.982 an hour <coughs> to information systems tech two positions at pay table grade NX 00210 21.954 per hour to 27.635 per hour. Create two new information systems tech one positions at pay table grade 17.426 per hour to 22.982 per hour. Oh my God. Okay. Um, so moved. Support. Bob, could I make a comment on this? Uh, I'd love a comment on this. I, I, I just like to say uh, two things. I know that one of the people in IT is re retiring and congratulations to him. And I just like to say my deepest sympathies to the IT department because they just had an employee pass away. And that's part of the reason for this motion. I just like to say from the board, we're very sorry to hear about that. Thank you, Susie. Um, um, Mr. Yes. Chair, I have a comment if that's okay. Okay, yes, it is okay. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, so 
although I am sympathetic to the IT department losing one of their staff members, I do think this is the wrong time to be creating new positions and giving out pay raises as we don't know how the economic impact of this is going to uh, hurt the future of Muskegon County and in, in our, our uh, current deficit problem. Anybody else, Susie? Yeah, I, I'd like to make a comment on that. I see that, I mean, I pretty certainly appreciate Commissioner Learning's position, but I do see at the bottom, it says annual cost, including salaries and all fringes for the four positions is uh, a decrease in their budget of $7,877. Anybody else? Zach? Um, you want to say anything or are you done? No, I'm, I'm done. Okay. Um, Kathy? Roll call. Commissioner Mahoney? Yes. Commissioner Nash? Yes. Commissioner Snyder? Yes. Commissioner Wilkins? She said yes. Commissioner Foster? Yes. Commissioner Hovey Wright? Yes. Chairman Hughes? Yes. Commissioner Laring? No. Commissioner Skolnick? Yes. Eight yes, one no. Okay, that um, that completes the items for consideration. The next item is old business. Does anyone have any old business to bring to the Ways and Means Committee? I'd like to bring an old business up. Um, it's old just because Bob talked about it about 30 minutes ago. Kathy, can you bring up those photos? <laughs> oh, I'd like to see them. Yes, I can. Bob took some really good photos of the uh, washout. I think Bob Lukens is still on too. That maybe you can explain a couple of them, but it looks like a whole new channel. Oh, wow. Yes, I'm still here. This is Bob Lukens, Community Development Director. Yes, um, there's a series of photos here, here that I'll show you. And the, the photo on the right, there uh, with the pine trees or Bob, we can't. I can't see it. I don't know what to do. It's on my screen, Bob. It's on my screen too. I see it. So, okay, it's so, on mine too. What so, Commissioner, go, go up to the left-hand corner and click on that button where it says "Go back to the screen view." <laughs> Who are you talking? You're talking to me. Yes. Left-hand button, screen view. I'm going to top. It says switch to screen share. Go click on that button. It'll take you back there. Oh, there we go. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, okay. Please. Okay. So the area with the pine trees on the left and the other types of trees on the right, I think they're, they could be oaks. Anyway, um, there used to be a dune in the middle there. And <laughs> That's about a 30 or 40 foot drop from the tree on the left uh, down to the water level there. Um, so that entire area from where I was standing here out to the lake has been washed out. That was a flat area where the um, group camping area was. Could you go to the next slide, Kathy? These are just some additional shots. Um, this was... Yeah, go, go to three. Yeah, go to the third one. <laughs> that one's not too great a shot. Here's some more um, slides from the flat camping area. Um, on the left sli slide, you can see... Well, on this slide... Okay, on the left <laughs> slide there, you can see the, the banks of the new creek or river that is formed um, that have just totally washed out. Uh, wow. There's about a, a six to 12 inch layer of topsoil and other um, you know, um, plant material. And under that begins the sand and wow. um, you know, a portion of a dune. So that washed yeah. out. On the right hand side, you can see some of those white pieces there. Those are our water lines. And those gray um, bollards that are sticking up there, um, there's two of them that you can see, maybe three. Um, those are uh, electrical bollards that have been undermined and almost washed away. 
the picnic table stacked up on the end uh, over on the tree line there. Fortunately, we stacked them up there because a number of other picnic tables were lost. They're out in Lake Michigan somewhere. Next slide, please. Here's just another view. And another, this is a view again of the water and some of the electrical bollards. Next slide. This is a view from standing further back. And you can see again where, where it's just washed out completely there. Um, there's the staff there was maybe 30, 40 feet away from me. So this is, I would say from the beginning of the washout out to Lake Michigan is probably 300 yards maybe, I give or take. Um, I, I also contacted a friend today that has a drone and he's going to go out there this week and take some, some uh, aerials of it because I have a Google map shot of it that I also sent to Kathy that she can forward on to you commissioners. But I made a, an outline of approximately where the washout is um, from a Google, Google map aerial image. So go to the next slide. There's the creek and, and you, you can see it's, it's flowing pretty good there. I think there's a couple more slides there. Keep going. There's a fire pit, um, a metal fire pit that fell in. We should be able to snatch that and bring it out soon. But, but the ground's very unstable on the edge there. So, uh, you know, we're gonna have to kind of have an assessment of that before we go down in there. Cause it's a pretty steep drop into the creek bed. Next slides, another view. Like I said, along right at the lake there, that whole dune was just washed out. Next slide. There's a closer view of it, another fire ring there. But you can see the, the water's rippling pretty good there. And up here in this picture at the top left, you can see a little bit of white water up there even. So it was moving good. Next slide. This is the Delta out on Lake Michigan. You can see it's, it's quite wide. It's maybe 10, 12 foot wide um, flowing out into Lake Michigan. The tannins from the um, trees and other debris that's up um, to the east are visible in the water there. Next slide. Bob, this would be really pretty if it wasn't so devastating to our park. Yes, I mean, you know, the one good thing is that there'll be a little beach out there now, you know? <laughs> it's unfortunate, but, you know, that delta has, has really um, nourished a beach, actually. So there'll be some beach there. <laughs> I don't know how people will get down to it, but there's a beach. Well, one good, one good thing there. about this is it happened when no one was out there. Yes, exactly. Um, and um, from what I understand, we did have a number of um, groups that that have reserved the spot. So, um, you know, we're, we're glad that no one was there. Um, this area also, I, I just wanted to mention that this area, and you'll be able to see from the Google aerial that I sent along to Kathy and she'll forward on to you is it never had any creek or any evidence of really uh, water or, mm -hmm. or drainage um, going into the Lake Michigan before that. It was further to the north. Uh, Bob, is there another access to the beach? From I the believe park? there is a, over on the, on the um, south side of Pioneer Park, there's another walkway down to the beach but I, I think some of the stairs there have been undermined from the high lake levels. So we'll have to assess that and take a look at that. But I think there is another way. And if not, people can get down to the beach on some of the um, trails there. There is a trail um, that we could forge down to the beach that would make it fairly safe for people to get down there if need, if need be, if there's no stairs left anywhere. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, Jeff Hittema there is pointing to the stairs out in Lake Michigan. So that's the unfortunate view of the washout at Pioneer Park. 
Uh, no, it's over. It's over a little bit to the left. There you go. That's approximately the area that was washed out. You can see there wow. were when this uh, Google shot was taken, there were campers there. That whole area is gone now. As is that dune right on Lake Michigan. Bob, that is that is unbelievable. It is. Seriously, that's Mother Nature. Um, hey, Kathy, can you and can you enable uh, the screen sharing? We can send you these photos. No, I want to put something up there if I can. She, it's disabled. I don't know if you know how to do that. It's a, it's disabled, so maybe you can't do it. You should be able to do it now. Um. Okay. Um. Oh, I don't know what's going on here. It's it's telling me that um. We see it. Do you see that? Do you see that picture? Yeah. So I, yes. I I got this from um somebody I'm friends with. He doesn't live in Norton Shores, but I if you have seen some of the damage that's going on uh, with homes, he said he contacted the county and the emergency manager, and I mean there's nothing we can do about that. I mean that he his house is destroyed. That's only part of it. I, I'm not going to show you the other the other uh, views, but it's uh, it's a disaster, and a lot of that is going on in the county. Even in my area, and we're fairly high. There's a lot of it in my area. Okay. Um, I'm um, I do have Rich Warner here to join us just for this discussion, if it's okay. I was going to bring it up on a new business, but if you allow it now, I'll have him join us. Okay. Um, do you want do we want to hear anything from because I think a lot of people have contacted the emergency manager looking for some kind of help. I don't know what, what we can do. Could we get an update from Rich, please, Bob? Yeah, is he here? Yes. Rich Warner, are you on the call? Are you on this? Yeah, I'm here. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. You want right, to very I know you've gotten a lot of uh, messages, phone calls about people asking for help. What can you tell us? Yeah, we've gotten, uh, and I couldn't tell you how many phone calls I've fielded. I've, I'm on one call and I get four more while I'm on the one call. It's been very, very busy. Um, we have a small staff here of about four people helping me to get all these emails answered. Um, input it into a spreadsheet so that we can start doing a damage set. I'm hoping to start doing that tomorrow morning, but we uh, there's so many of them to try to get done and map out a route to get them done. Um, I'll probably be here most of the night trying to get that ready. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much a, a countywide um, event. I mean, there's I don't think there's anywhere in Muskegon County that doesn't have water. I truly don't, and uh, the, probably the the best we're going to do as far as to help them is the Small Business Administration, that that low interest loan that they'll be able to get, that's probably what they're going to get. I don't see this being a FEMA event. FEMA doesn't recognize basements. They only recognize essential living space, which is basically your floor. So. Um, but we're doing all we can with what we have. Um, it's a very daunting task. Um, we're, you know, we're doing this one bite at a time because otherwise I think we'd get too overwhelmed. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're having to deal with that. I mean, I, you can imagine what people are, I'm seeing all kinds of posts on my Facebook feed with mm -hmm. people with water in their basement and far worse. Uh, I saw pictures of uh, Edgewater in uh, the, uh, what is that, Bluffton area? I don't know. Um, yeah. I mean, those houses, some of them, they're ruined. Well, and they can't get, they can't even get emergency vehicles or postal, you know, post uh, office people in there. So it's worse than it's ever been. 
No. All right. Well, let's move on. Um, hey, Bob, can I say something to Rich real quick? Yes. Yes, Gary. Uh, Rich, I think you've done a great job. And I would ask if you could update the commissioners every three or four days or as you have a chance to let us know what's going on in the county. Let me, um, let me get back to you on Friday because we're, we're on a time crunch right now. All this information needs to get to the state by midnight you have Friday. Time, you have time, Rich. Take care of the residents first. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bob, I have a, an issue, uh, old business question. Go ahead, Zach. Um, so <clears throat> I want to go back to this motion that was from the IT department. Susie said that it was a decrease, <clears throat> but the motion I have read uh, says annual cost, including salary and all fringes for all four positions is estimated as an increase of $42,738 to a decrease of 7,000 annually, depending on medical insurance collected by the individuals in the newly created positions. So I'm assuming it could be a 7,000 decrease if all four people chose not to get the county's health insurance, but it I doubt that's going to be the case. It looks like it's a forty-two thousand seven hundred and thirty-eight dollar increase. Bob, can I explain this one? Yes, go ahead. From what we gathered from the review meeting, um, Commissioner Laring, the the ranges between the forty-two as a high and the seven thousand decrease as a low, depending on what they select as insurance. Our hope is that they'll select a single as insurance. But if they select family, it'll be more, and that's where it will go up. But from what we understand, they're they're mostly younger, and we'll probably have a majority single, if not all. So that's what we're hoping for. So the worst case scenario is forty two thousand the increase, and the <coughs> best case scenario is a seven thousand dollar decrease. Eight. Correct. All right, um, the next item is uh, new business. Is there any new business uh, to be brought before the Ways and Means Committee? Mr. Chair, uh, Yes, Gary. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Mark. Um, I would like to ask the administration to somehow get a report out on the senior millage of the 2.2 million, how much is being paid for salaries. Um, I saw that Carla Benton has now even got an assistant I'm just wondering how much are we paying in payroll out of the 2.2 million that was set aside for services to the um, elderly? Okay, I Thank can you. do that. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Any other? Yes, I did. Um, yes, I believe last week we shared you a, a, a video and a link for a work share program. So on Thursday, we'll be discussing the work share program and how all departments are um responding to that plan um again it's uh, i'll keep it short today but we'll get into it in more detail on thursday but the whole idea is to uh reduce the work week uh in your department one way or another and uh, be offset by a state program that they're offering uh to us so check your emails and we, we can send it out again if you didn't see it already but it's, it's the work share program thank you Okay, um, we now have time for public comment um, from anybody. Uh, there's there's a total of 50 people on this call, so there's some people out there. Um, Kathy, could you take that off the screen, the, ag the agenda, so we can see more people? Good, thank you. Um, if anybody, uh, if anybody would like to make a public comment on anything, this is your opportunity. I do. I'm Go ahead. Not, uh, is There's anybody? one person. Okay. Can you see who it is? I recognize the voice, but I don't know his name. Oh. Go ahead. Sir. Okay, Sean. Is yes. that you? Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, let me get to my screen here. Uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, Sean Campbell, three six McLaughlin four two Muskegon. And uh, I, in general comment regarding the Causeway and Memorial Park, what is the plan for the water, water there? I 
I, I was quite shocked to hear that the pump, the pump and dam were removed to control the water. Is that correct? Um, in uh, those videos um, of the recent water damage there in the park only seem to highlight this. I am actually in favor of returning Muskegon water to a cold running uh, trout stream the way it was a long time ago. But uh, I, I do not know fully if the removing the pump and dam was related to that, uh, but it sure seems like it. So there's, so cool. there, so there's the plan to deal with, all, is there a plan to deal with all this at Water and Memorial Park? And how much does it cost? Financial responsibility should, should come before fish. It seems to almost take, off the, take over the roadway. Um, I do not think the, the board is so silly as to do, not do anything about the water, but uh, there doesn't seem to be a plan right now. Um, Further, in regards to the buildings that are in disappear in Pioneer Park, Pioneer Park used to be, a, 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 and still is, a favorite camping spot uh, for me. Please maintain the buildings you have before building more. That really seems obvious. Uh, on county building policies, not surprisingly, I'm not, sure, uh, I'm not sure about protecting courthouse employees or the public. The only thing that is clear is protection of policies that have been handed down to you in this case, unconstitutional policies. In Your regards time to- that, Commissioner Sonnet. Yes, yeah, it's two minutes. Thank up. you. Okay, thanks, Sean. Uh, anybody else? I can't, I don't see anybody. I'm looking at both screens, but I, okay. Uh, Susie, is that just, are you adjusting your camera or you don't want to see me anymore? <laughs> <laughs> You're still on mute. Yeah, yeah I, I was just checking to see if there were any hands raised and there are not. Okay. All right, then final board comments. Mr. Chair, may I? Yes, you may. Just for the commissioner's own knowledge at Veterans Park, the dam has been replaced with a newer style dam and the pump has been running. Um, they are looking through the parks committee at doing another dam, but that could be some time out. The original projects were all paid from the NOAA grant on the park redo that we did two years ago starting. Gary, if I may ask, I, I haven't driven on the causeway in the last week. Um, is that pump keeping up? No, it's so it, it's it's on, I've never seen it this high out there. It is terrible. Um, if the dam was not in place like it is right now, it would be over the road. Okay. All right, any other board comments? If not, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Yep. See you Thursday. See you Thursday.